over 40 minutes of useless zombies facts, let's go. Starting off in Nocturne and Toten, in the help room, there is a wall barrier that these zombies can break down and come in from. But zombies will never do that until round five. So up until that point, you will never have to worry about this barrier. Now I know what you're thinking, who can possibly survive that long for this to ever be relevant? Well, some people have, and if you can somehow manage it, you'll be safe in this room up until that point. Now, Nocturne and Toten's name roughly translates to Night of the Living Dead or Night of the Undead. And this could always be a loose reference to George Romero's film Night of the Living Dead, which was a 1968 horror film. That kind of first introduced the idea of like these flesh-eating ghouls that would go on to be synonymous with the term zombie. The story revolves around several people trapped in a farmhouse in rural Pennsylvania, constantly under attack by zombies. The film would go on to be a success and gross $12 million. And you have to remember, that's back in 1968, so that's a lot of money. And would go off to spawn an entire franchise. So with the name Nocturne and Toten and George Romero being the godfather of zombies, it's no surprise that George Romero ended up making an appearance in our zombie games in Call of the Dead. Also, one cool part about this map is one of the quotes that you can sometimes hear while you're playing the game. One of the Marines will randomly break the fourth wall and mention this app. And that app just so happens to be today's sponsor. Dungeon Hunter 6, a classic ARPG, where you play as a bounty hunter with plenty of class options as you fight and tame bosses in both PvE and PvP game modes. Dungeon Hunter 6 is very interesting because killing the boss is not the end. Every boss that you take on and end up defeating, there's a very unique mechanism that will not only let you loot, ride, and fly them, but you can also summon them. And to top that up with some of the most insane creative designs I've ever seen, where you can literally turn into a cat on a stealth mission. Like who else would let you do that? And that's not even mentioning the customizable mount system, where you can ride like so many different fantasy creatures, it's insane. Not only is the game super fun, with tons and tons of unique mechanics, it looks amazing. Just look at these 3D graphics and just look at how awesome everything looks. Look at all these sick animations, all the beautiful lights. If this game doesn't turn you on, I don't know what will. So what are you waiting for? Get the game for free right now on Android and iOS. If you use my link in the description and or scan the QR code on screen right now, you will get a special starter pack worth $50. You will get 10 summoning scrolls, one SSR Lieutenant, Demonic Wolf, and one accessory pack. So hurry up, ignore the casting couch that I am on, and use my link down below in the description and check it out. Back to the video. Have you ever wondered how exactly they got some of the sounds in Zombies? Well, some of the melee sounds can be attributed to stabbing a watermelon multiple times with a pie slicer. And if you think I'm just making that up, here's the developers themselves saying that. But no, we, we, we watch a ton of movies and, um, you know, we get inspired by things like Evil Dead and... Uh, we really wanted the, the zombies to kind of have an old school sound, so some of the processing and stuff we did is, is stuff that they were doing, you know, in the 80s even. Um, and it's kind of giving them the signature sound that we've got now. What are, some of the, what are some of the secrets, if you can tell us, if we can look into the audio room and tell us, what are, what are some of the things you use to kind of create the zombie sounds? Are there any strange fruits or vegetables or anything? <laughs> watermelon is big for watermelon. gory sounds. Yes. You said, Kevin. You stab a watermelon with a, with a uh, uh, pie slicer and you get a nice slicing Money. sound. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really cool sounding. <laughs> but yeah, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, one of the things that we do is um, We'll get into our own sound booth there, and we'll uh, we'll just go up to the microphone and go, "Okay, start recording." And all right, here we go. And we'll just take that and we'll put effects on it. We'll we'll switch our voices around, and uh, we'll make some creepy, crazy, weird zombie voices that then we put in the game, and it's really fun to <laughs> play around in the sound booth for and a while. Now, I always talk about this, but one of my favorite parts about Nocturne and Toten is just the random things on the ground that you can melee. There are random gas canisters and helmets just dicking around all over the map that you can interact with. They do absolutely nothing, but I still think it's cool that there's just little things on the ground that you can shoot or knife or move around in just various ways. Now before zombies was zombies, before we had the even concept of zombies, Treyarch was looking for different ideas for the end sequence of Call of Duty World of War. And one of the original ideas was you being a German holding back the allies on the beaches of Normandy. And this is what one of the devs themselves had to say about that. We had kicked an idea for an end sequence in Call of Duty World at War, where you'd be placed in a bunker which you couldn't leave. To your right would be a German officer screaming at you to get on some MGs, and to your left would be those MGs mounted on a window overlooking a beach. It was then that the player was supposed to realize that you were on the beaches of Normandy from the German perspective, and you had to mow down allies as they came up the beach. 
Eventually, towards the end of the credits, as the pace got to be too heavy, and there were so many guys that eventually they broke through the beachhead, you'd hear a banging on the door of the bunker. A few seconds later, an explosion would rip through the bunker, knock you unconscious, and you'd be on the ground facing up. An American squad would light up the place, and a badass US soldier would stop over you, slowly aim his gun at you, and fire. Fade to black, finish rolling the credits. And the reason they never ended up going with this was because they thought they would receive a, a lot of backlash from having the player play as a Nazi. That kind of sucks because I've always said I've wanted a game that gives you like the German perspective too, because I think history is very interesting and I would love to see it from all different sides, but maybe one day. Now, I would hope you know this next fact because I've been stating it forever, but in Nocturne, Toten, Verrucked, and Shinonuma, if you are playing solo, only 24 zombies will spawn in per round. Now normally like once you get up to the medium to high rounds it's 24 zombies at a time and then once you kill some more will spawn in but the max zombies on the map will only ever be 24. Well back in World of War, Nocturne, Toten, Verruckt, and Shinonuma it was if you're playing solo only 24 total per round will spawn in. That's what made high rounds so easy back in those maps and eventually they did fix that for Doris. But in case you ever wondered how people got to such high rounds back in those days that would be why. Once the zombies eventually get you in Nocturne Toten, you're going to hear this song. A lot of people would recognize this as a lullaby for a dead man, but when it was originally created, it was never meant to be a full song. Here's what Kevin Sherwood himself has to say about it. Uh, well, the soundtrack was actually originally just a, a guitar riff from Nocturne Toten, where uh, we wanted to put something cool sounding when you die. And uh, when it shipped, uh, it was actually <laughs> Brian who suggested that we turn it into a whole song. And my best impression. I, I told him I didn't think it was possible, but then he said I, I had to do it, so <laughs> that's, that's the worst thing you could say. Yeah, exactly. Challenge accepted. Right. Yeah, done. We just wanted to see if we could actually produce something out of it. You know, right. we had a little bit of time. So, and, uh, you know, I, there we, was no reason to do it other than, hey, let's see if this if yeah, we why can, not? You know, right? yeah. sounds cool, right? So I expense, uh, yeah, went and expensed the uh, beer and whiskey budget and then went home, wrote something, and then threw it in. And zombie it up. And that's how it, I think that's how it happened, yeah. Now back when Nocturne Toten was originally conceived, when the map had originally came out, there was never a storyline. There really wasn't ever planned to be this huge thing that we have nowadays. So the entire storyline for World of War was, hey, we're a couple guys and zombies are coming and then we die. But eventually down the road, Treyarch decided to go back in and insert a storyline. And this is the official story of Nocturne Toten. June 4th, 1945, Nocturne Toten. An allied plane malfunctions over an airfield and crashes. German army trucks transporting the undead in element 115 between group 935 facilities are struck in the crash. Four marines surviving the crash hold out against the undead as long as they can, but they eventually die to the undead army. So that is the official story of Nocturne Toten. Four unnamed marines holding out as long as they can, but eventually, just like the Nocturne Toten intro, the zombies catch up to them. Now nowadays in zombie games, you can just jump right in. Right there on the menu, just like multiplayer and campaign, there's going to be a zombies option. Well, back in World at War, when the game had just released, they didn't promote zombies, they didn't let people know it was a thing. It was just an easter egg that you got after completing the campaign. So once you completed the campaign, it would look a little something like this.
And you can imagine everyone's surprise when after beating the campaign, they get introduced to this badass game mode without having any knowledge of it. It was uh, quite the surprise back in the day. Some of the zombies animations that you could see in World of War were actually reused from campaign. One of the original inspirations for the whole zombie concept comes from the level Little Resistance, which had Japanese soldiers looking dazed after a rocket strike, and those Japanese soldiers would sort of stumble around and people mentioned and said, hey, they kind of look like zombies. So that's kind of how the original zombies idea started to get implemented into some people's heads at Treyarch. Now, if you were to think of some games that influenced zombies, what would come to mind? Surely not Geometry Wars and Tower Defense games, because those were some of the biggest influences for Call of Duty Zombies, believe it or not. But probably one of the biggest influences was a Flash game called The Last Stand, where you play as a survivor fighting off zombies. Zombies run towards you and you have to keep rebuilding barricades and upgrading your guns and hold off the zombies for as long as you can. Just watching this gameplay, you can see how Treyarch took a lot of ideas and concepts off of this and implemented it into a first person shooter. So I would say it's fair to say that The Last Stand is probably the original Zombies idea. It was actually published back in November 28th of 2007. So if you want to play it, I will leave a link to The Last Stand down below in the description. It's very interesting to play and just thinking about if this was never invented, we would probably not have all the things that we have nowadays. Now in early Zombies development, it was never called Nazi Zombies. The words were actually flipped. For a very long time, it was called Zombie Nazis and think god they actually switched that up because nazi zombies just rolls off the tongue a lot better than zombie nazis now the four marines you play as on Baruch are tank dempsey john banana Smokey, and paxton gunner ridge tank dempsey was never originally on Baruch. when the Baruch map came out there really wasn't a storyline set in stone yet there were some trickles of a beginning story but nothing really concrete so tank dempsey was never originally on Baruch and was later added in storyline wise now right after Varuk, Tank Dempsey ended up getting captured and John Banana and Smokey were killed in action while Paxton Ridge was able to escape. And one interesting thing about the four playable Marines on Varuk is that they were kind of a test for a playable main character. They were really setting the groundwork to try to introduce four set main characters and the Marines on Varuk were a perfect way to experiment with that and one of the reasons we actually ended up getting four playable characters with very distinct personalities and voices is because it was very hard to tell which marine you were on Varuk, and people would often confuse the marines and just lump them all together. And during that same interview that I showed you guys earlier, the developers also had this to say about the marines. Well, it's also a good place for us to prototype kind of new ideas. So, you know, we had this idea for, uh, you know, having a first person voice, you know, what would that sound like? But we didn't have any infrastructure for that because typically in Call of Duties, we haven't had a, a protagonist that actually speaks. So. Uh, with Verruckt, we actually said, well, you know what, let's, let's try this out. And so we, we threw the Marines in, and, and everybody kind of had a generic script, but uh, we got the system in place, and, um, you know, we always had these problems where you couldn't tell who was talking because the script was too much, so we said, you know what, let's add characters. And then from there, you know, we sort of evolved the story, and, uh, you know, once again, listening to community feedback and everything, we kind of grew it from there. The, the playable characters are who they are because right. we don't have cutscenes to explain who they are, so... We came up with the most basic stereotypes possible, so the second that somebody hears two or three lines, they're like, okay, I'm the drunk Russian, I get it. Right. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> over time, we've been able to, to evolve them a little bit and make them, you know, cooler and more funny, but originally there was just literally no choice. It was like, how do you make a character that somebody's going to get without any introduction whatsoever, you know? And, the, you know, one of the rules on the story side is we can't touch core gameplay. We will never stop the zombie spawns. We will never do a cutscene. Like, everything we do has to, has to happen within that parameter, you know? So uh, the stereotypes are the only way we could do that. And also, continuing on with the Marines thing, on Revelations, there is a radio that gives us more insight to the ultimate fate of John Banana and Smokey. Field report, a quiet retort, the mission has all gone south. It's Johnny here, Smokey is near, most likely with meat in his mouth. We've been here for ages, I ran out of pages, but now have a mic to record. The mission has failed, McCain must have bailed, and now we must fight off a horde. We came to Farouk with low ammo and luck, and now Smokey's lost his head. We went down the halls, they bit Smokey's balls, and now he walks with the dead. They call me Banana, I worked at a cabana, I rhymed to keep myself sane. Though Smokey is dead, I'm holding his head, which right now is eating my brain. 
And one of my favorite things about zombies is this headless glitch. Sometimes when you shoot off a zombie's head, he will continue running at you and then eventually die. Well, this originally started out as a bug. It was never meant to be in the game, but the developers loved it so much that they decided to keep it in. And I'm very glad they did because it really does feel like a zombie game when you shoot off their head and they continue running at you. Now, early in zombies development, before they had the artwork for like the double points, the max ammo and stuff, they were actually replaced with random objects. The double points was replaced with a tea kettle, the insta kill was a crow, and the max ammo was a giant rat. You can only imagine the chaosness and hectic of somebody screaming at you, get the crow, get the crow, or I got a rat, everybody reload. But as you know, of course they got the artwork for it, but those were just some of the very earlier set models for those things. Now on Varuk, there is also a glitch in the speed cola. Well, not really a glitch, more like a spawn manipulation in the speed cola room. If you have the door to speed cola open from the power side, but you do not open the other door, you can get the zombies only spawning in from one direction, which makes it very, very easy to camp in this area and get to a pretty decent round. I wouldn't recommend this to get to high, high rounds, but if you want to get through those early rounds without really having to worry about much, this is a fantastic strategy to do. Now around Verruckt, there are going to be multiple zombie posters chilling on the wall, and I'm not going to lie, these posters look absolutely amazing, but one interesting thing is on the Quick Revive poster, it doesn't actually have the Quick Revive logo, it has an earlier concept of the Quick Revive logo. So it must have been pretty late in the perk development that they actually ended up changing it and gave us the new one that we all know and love. Well I should kind of say old one now because that perk came out so so long ago. Now, have you ever wondered, why are there sprinters on Verruckt? Why do they run so fast? How do we go from Nocturne and Toten to this? Well, one of the reasons we have sprinters on Verruckt is because of the community. Everybody in the community had a complaint that Nocturne and Toten was just too slow. The early rounds take forever because the zombies just take so long to get in. And people in the zombies community would obviously complain about that. And Treyarch, as they do, takes a lot of notes from the community. So, in Verruckt, they decide to add sprinters. And if you don't believe me, Here's them saying it for themselves. We spend a lot of time looking at the community feedback. You know, one of the great things about DLC is you get a chance to actually respond to some of the issues the community has. So we made some changes to the zombies specifically. You know, some of them are faster. You know, we've definitely changed that. We've got some uh, interesting things happen if, you, if they lose their legs, for example. We've got some um, new animations sets in there. Um, there's also lots of new features uh, within the game as well, like we have a perks machine where you can now buy power-ups, um, which will last until you go down, and if your player revives you, you'll have to buy them again. Good as new! Obviously it's a brand new map, it's a lot of new interesting gameplay, we've got some traps in there the player can set off, uh, so there's a lot of new features within it. Now this next part really doesn't have to do with zombies, but it kind of gives me that zombies vibe and feel, and I think it's interesting enough to show you guys. On the multiplayer map Hangar, if you come down to this area, you can hear what appears to be a Japanese soldier torturing an American POW. And if we head over to the multiplayer map Asylum, which is the map that Verruckt was based on, if you come to the bathroom slash showers areas and you listen very closely, you can hear some creepy whispering and a little girl crying. And directly above that, you can hear an ominous piano playing creepily in the background.
Now, Varrocht might have one of the most pointless doors and the most expensive wall buys in Zombies history. On the American side of spawn, if you open this 750 door, you are greeted with literally nothing but a BAR wall buy, but hey, hang on now. It's deployable for 2,500 points. But here's the thing, you can't really deploy it, and it's just a very expensive BAR. I mean, the regular BAR is already on the wall near Speed Cola. But it does appear that this was some cut content and it was cut pretty late considering that this room still exists and you can actually see somebody using a deployable BAR in the trailer. I dying? And considering outside the map there's multiple deployable weapons, it seems like Treyarch was onto something really really cool but had to axe it at the last minute. On the Black Ops 1 version of Verruckt, there is a radio outside of the map that when you shoot it behaves very similar to the Nocturne and Toten radio. The OG crew that we play as in Zombies never had dedicated models, and what I mean by that is that there was never a player model specifically made for them, they were all just reused assets from the campaign. For example, Takio's character is actually just a basic Japanese officer that you would see in the campaign. The first person that you actually see in the campaign happens to be Takio, he is this random Japanese officer that's real close to torturing the absolute shit out of you, but luckily the marines come in and save the day. The last known thing that Takio was seen doing was getting choked out by Sullivan and presumably just left on the floor to die if he didn't die already from getting choked out. But it's always good to know, put a couple more taps in him just to be sure. The next character you would run into would be Tank Dempsey, who is Private Polanski. You meet him very early on in the campaign in Little Resistance, and for the rest of the campaign, he's really not much of a major character and is mainly a side-slash-background character that aids you throughout the rest of the missions. The biggest impact he has on the story is towards the end on the final mission where you can either save Robok, Polanski dies, or if you don't save Robok and allow him to die, Polanski ends up giving you his dog tags. So he's not too much of a main character and is mainly relegated to a side slash background character. The next character we're going to meet is going to be in one of the greatest Call of Duty campaign missions of all time, and that's going to be Heinrich Ainsel. He is the bad guy that Reznov has been stalking and trying to kill. He is the one behind the brutal massacre of the Soviet soldiers and civilians and Reznov has given you the task of taking him out. And you never really get an up-close personal look at Richthofen's character model, you really only ever see him from afar, but at the end of that mission he ends up meeting his demise. Now the last character, Nikolai, is probably the most important in the campaign, and that's going to be Chernov. Right behind Reznov, Chernov is probably the number two most important person in the Soviet campaign. Getting an introduction very early, you also learn that his nature is very, very different from Nikolai's, being more of a pacifist and having much more empathy than Nikolai definitely does. Because in the mission where you commit a teeny tiny bit of war crimes, he is against shooting the dying Germans, while, you know, we definitely are not. Turn up, you should learn from Dimitri. He understands the nature of mercy. But unfortunately, his story does not end well because he ends up getting torched by a flamethrower as he storms the Reichstag. And after he dies, Reznov collects his diary, claims that the world needs to hear this, and calls him a true hero. So it's very interesting to see their player models versus who they actually are in zombies. And the amount of fan theories back in the day that said that if the zombie storyline never happened, that this would have been their ultimate fate. So many theories about that back in the day was rather entertaining. One of my favorite part about OG Zombies is just how much input the fans actually had. Probably the biggest input that we ever had was Samantha. Samantha was not born from Treyarch. Samantha was born from a forum post where someone thought that when a zombie swiped at you, it said Sam. Again, the community really has helped us take the story to places, you know, that even we never expected. I remember just yeah. a small little anecdote. Um, I was on, I think, I'm pretty sure it was Call of Duty Zombies forum, and, um, uh, someone had written a post that said, guys, I was playing, and there's a zombie that when he swipes you, I think he says something. You know, he, he comes up to you and he goes, Sam, Sam. And who do you guys think Sam is? And so we read this and we're like, hmm, yeah, who, who is Sam? Samantha? We should make oh, a we, Sam. We could make a Sam. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why in, you know, uh, in Doris, when we wrote the, um, the Samantha and Dr. Maxis, that's why the that's little girl's track. name was Samantha, it was become 
some guy in the community heard a zombie say Sam, and uh, that spawned this this whole idea. Now you know who yeah. Sam is. So sometimes the community really has a direct impact on yeah. on future projects. Yeah, I mean, we we More read we know. read what they say a lot. A lot. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty interesting to see how much Treyarch actually listened to us back in the day and how much of our input and our suggestions actually made it into zombies. I mean, one of the biggest baddies was actually from the community. Now, did you know that on Shinonuma, there is a radio that once activated, it's going to give you the Verrucked trailer. Now you have to remember, Shinonuma was kind of the start of the storyline, but things really didn't pick up until Darice. So they were really just kind of experimenting and playing around with what all they could do and really kind of nailed it down with Darice. So Shinonuma and Verrucked were really just experiments until they could figure out what they wanted to do. I would say that that's probably when the core of the spine got written. Um, we, we had some story ideas even back in Shinonuma and, and actually in Verrucked as well, but I don't think it was fully formed yet. Uh, what happened was is we... Uh, in, in Shinonuma, we hid the, the secret radio message, basically just to see how long it would take for somebody to find it. And, you know, we had references to Nazi conspiracies and Ted Guska and a couple other cool things, just wanted people to find, like, written on the walls or whatever. But what happened was, is somebody found the message, uh, the hidden message from Peter, and it, suddenly there were all these theories and websites popping up, and there were all these things, and we were like, oh, whoa, what do we do? Like, <laughs> I guess we're going to have to actually, you know, rein this in and do something with it. Um, and so that's kind of where it all started, was, was in Shino. Now you probably know that on World of War, Nocturne Toten, Verrucked, and Shinonuma, if you're playing solo, only 24 zombies will spawn in. But if you happen to unlock a perk during the middle of the round, three more zombies are going to spawn in, making a total of 27 zombies per round instead of 24. So if you were wanting to up your ante a little bit, improve your little stats, you know, do a little stat padding, that is definitely a way to do it. Now on the PC and Xbox version of Shinonuma, dog rounds sound like this. Four-legged freak sacks. Just more shit to blow up. But on the PlayStation 3, they sound just a little bit different. Oh, those don't sound like freak bags. So you got to give it to PlayStation 3. Usually they just end up tanking a lot of things that they're involved with. <clears throat> all New Vegas. But this might be one of the only instances that they got something right. If I were to ask you, what do you think is the most powerful thing in the entirety of Call of Duty Zombies? You would probably think the Apothecan Servant, the Wonder Waff, Dr. Monty, Gobblegums. And you would be correct to an extent, but you're also wrong because it's a fact that the most powerful object in the entirety of Call of Duty Zombies is the World at War Shinonuma Flogger. This thing is a literal god killer. If you turn on god mode in Shinonuma and you walk through the flogger, it will kill you. You can walk through any other trap and zombies with god mode and you're going to be fine. But for some reason, the flogger is so powerful that it can even kill gods. So instead of praying to whatever god you pray to, we should all be praying to the flogger. Now for our zombies crew, it was really hard to tell a story in zombies. How do you tell a story without cutscenes or really too much dialogue going back and forth? And Treyarch thought that, hey, let's give them biographies. So in World of War, every character got a biography. And these would give you a little bit of information about the character's nature and their overall past. And it's very interesting to see just how much of this was like axed and how much of all of this like just got completely ignored going down the line. Tank Dempsey's reads like this. American hero, hand him a loaded weapon, a good woman, and something to shoot at, and he is happy. Enrage him, and he will rip your guts out and use them as a bandolier. Dempsey was selected for this mission after he showed his true grit during the Battle of Peleliu. 
Remarkable though it may seem, his unit was captured during the early raids before the main invasion, and he spent two weeks in a rat infested bamboo cage submerged in malaria water. Well, that did not stop the tank. After he gnawed his way through the cage, he then gnawed his way through his captors armed with only a bobby pin and his medal of honor, which he keeps secreted in various body cavities. Now you know there is no before the war for Dempsey and there is no after. There is only the legend of Tank Dempsey and how he will win the war for the rest of us. Nikolai's reads like this. Stalin himself cannot stare Nikolai in the eye. No one can. There in his eyes you will see the soul of a man burning with hatred of all things living. His closet is full of skeletons, many of them with flesh still attached. Early in his career, Nikolai had quickly made his way through the party ranks by killing the next man in line and by marrying politically. Ultimately, his aspirations all came crashing down after his fifth wife mysteriously died while cleaning his axe with her neck. Little did he know that she had been sleeping with a high-ranking party official on the side. This made Nikolai infamous and his reputation spread quickly throughout the party. It was not long before Stalin himself had heard about Nikolai. More importantly, he feared Nikolai. As soon as the war started, our hero was dropped on the front lines and forgotten about where he wallowed in self-pity and vodka for several years. There are many weapons in his arsenal, not at least of which is his breath. Takio Masaki, enter Takio, for whom life has no meaning if not to perfect your discipline and to reveal true character and honor. Perhaps he ponders this and other philosophical questions as his katana slices through the flesh and sinew of his enemy. Our hero was born into wealth. His family dynasty dates back several centuries and throughout the time they have been highly decorated samurai and bushido. Well, Takio is no exception to this celebrated bloodline. Even when the family first saw the young, life-filled five-year-old Takio playing in the street with his katana and slicing the tails off terrified kittens. It was obvious he was desired to bring honor to the Masaki name. Reserved and reflected, the war is the perfect opportunity for Takio to explore his bloodlust and study the nature of those less honorable than himself. So if you fall victim to a swift action, you might know that you have helped a man better than you reach enlightenment. And my personal favorite, Rick Toffins, Beware the Dock, a message that was scrawled across walls of every town under Axis control. Starvation may cripple you, dysentery may wreck you, and gunfire may rip the flesh from your bones, but beware the dock. This is Dr. Rick Toffin, known affectionately as the butcher to his victims as they scream in agony moments before he snuffs out their light. All through his career, Rick Toffin has been at the forefront of torture and information extraction research. Richthofen is an incurable sociopath and sees no moral distinction between natural death and murder. The victim is the victim, regardless of how their demise manifests itself. Dr. Richthofen has collection of stuffed animals, most of all posed in positions of terror at the instant of their death. So it's pretty interesting to see how they are described here, and then going on to see how they kind of unfolded and the rest of their background that got revealed through the rest of zombies. On the Black Ops 1 version of Shinanuma, there is a radio easter egg that you can activate by hitting various radios around the map and then coming to the main hut, and some audio will play over the speaker telling you exactly how our main characters got from Der Reese to Kino Der Toten. Uh, where are we? A better question is... When are we? No! Where the hell is my vodka? Oh, yes, of course! The DG2 must have overloaded the teleporter, ripping space-time, backtracing us to the future! How wonderful! There's my vodka! Thank you, Taki. Oh, come on, Tax. Suck it up and walk it off. Now, if you are a huge fan of Zombies history and Zombies development like I am, you might find this next bit a little bit interesting. Now, back in the day when blogs were, like, really a thing, so, you know, showing my age here, boomer alert, Activision would update the community on their website and give you information on the upcoming DLCs. And this is just some of what they had to say about Darice. Troops, we are digging deeper into the mystery of this zombie's plague, and we have uncovered shrouded intel detailing a hidden facility in the German countryside. Trailing this conspiracy is one rabbit hole we fear to enter, but if we ever hope to eradicate this threat, we must pursue all leads. Intel is limited, but we have managed to recover blueprints of the structure. The facility is known as Darice, which translates to the giant in English. What we have gathered so far leads us to believe the facility was used for the most gruesome and ghastly experiments. I tremble at the thought of what horrors await those who enter its bloody doorways. Meanwhile, our engineers have been able to discover massive amounts of electricity consumed within the facility's walls. Rumors suggest that the scientists within were able to create working prototypes of human teleporters. Initially, I would have shrugged this intel off as nonsense, but after transcribing the reports of Shinanuma, I don't know what to believe. For anyone who finds themselves within the walls of this facility, I pray for your safe return. If this is the epicenter of the zombie infestation, may you find the courage to face this evil in its most unholy grounds and find the strength to send its inhabitants back to hell. And they were doing stuff like this, like giving you intel reports on almost every aspect of the map. The Pack Punch one is actually pretty interesting. 
There were just too many of them. A hellhound took a chunk of my thigh and I'm losing blood fast. There's not too much time left, so I'll pass on what I know. The pack punch machine. Apparently you can put in practically any weapon into this thing and out comes a super powerful version of your weapon. This is great news for us. I just hope you last long enough to use it. Pass this info on to HQ. It's the full list of weapon upgrades and good luck against the undead. I got a bad feeling you'll need it. And one of the more interesting ones is about the mysterious radio transmissions. Consider yourself lucky troops because we're about to let you in on a little secret. Soldiers from the darkest reaches of our offenses are finding themselves facing the army of the damned. But that's not all they're discovering. Underneath this evil, we're guessing there is a Nazi spiderweb that connects all of these outbreaks and that out there, there are clues that can expose its gossamer threads. We are gathering reports of strange sightings and happenings, besides the undead rising from their graves that is, which seem to be creating trends within the field. What we're presenting you today is one of these trends. Ever since the second outbreak at Nocturne and Toten, troops have been noticing strange radio transmissions and broadcasts taking place in the dead of the night. Back at HQ, we're helping these rumors can help you soldiers come closer to unraveling the truth. Some of our men who have braved the woods of Nocturne and Toten have dug up intel which we found earlier to be irrelevant, but under recent circumstances, we now deem to be vital in our growing case file. Our contacts say that there is a hidden radio that for all rational reasons should not operate, but does. Those who have managed to activate the radio say that it plays endless cycles of haunting songs, and some of our Soviet allies have reported hearing their homeland's victory song throughout its cursed speakers. Of course, these phantom transmissions do not end in Nocturne and Toten. Shina Numa holds its own fair share of mysteries. Within the walls of Shina Numa, some have reported hearing not music, but radio calls from a rogue signal. We haven't been able to get an accurate report on what is said within this radio call, but we are sure it is connected to this conspiracy. We can't be sure, but we are thinking that hidden transmissions can be found in the recently discovered Doris as well. That's why we're sharing this information with you troops. We need you to head out to the field and discover what we can't. You'll need to be smart and you'll need teamwork to survive, but if you can get past the hordes of flesh-eating undead, you may find the truth behind the horror. Within the supply section of the Call of Duty HQ, you'll find the only known transmission we have. End of transmission. And it's just stuff like this that is completely fascinating and I love it. Now going back to campaign a little bit, this does tie in a, a teeny bit with zombies. There is the Raygun Easter Egg on the second mission, Little Resistance. But have you ever wondered what is actually said and the history behind this? Well, let's get to it. The stray creator, Jesse Snyder, tweeted out a couple years ago that he was in fact almost fired for putting this easter egg in the game. But luckily he was not and everyone absolutely loved this easter egg. But what exactly is being said? And the answer is not really much important. The dialogue that you're hearing was just extra dialogue and narration from the intro cutscene. That just happened to be cut content. And all they did was reverse it, add some reverb and delay, and that's what you get. <laughs> It was never really meant to give you any information, but just to sound cool as all hell. But in case you are actually wondering what it does say, thanks to a six-year-old video from Rizzo, we actually know what it says. And a rough translation goes like this. So even for a single second, we have to try our best to hold the enemies back. The blank forces are likely to reinforce. Our army must stop blank completely. I repeat, defend the command center by any means necessary. Don't let the enemy forces and then the radio stops. And the blank parts are supposedly supposed to be enemy, but there's really no definite translation. So that is the mystery Easter egg behind what they are saying. It was an Easter egg that was slipped in by Jesse Snyder, which he almost got fired for. And it was just some unused content from the campaign that they tweaked a little bit and threw in to make a cool little Easter egg. Now, all of the zombie maps in World War have a multiplayer counterpart, and I believe we've talked about the Nocturne and Toten one in a previous video. So not only was it in campaign, it was also a multiplayer map called Airfield, and I really like this multiplayer map. A lot of sniping was done from the Nocturne and Toten bunker. Huge fan of this. And like we previously mentioned earlier in this video, Verrucht was based off the multiplayer map Asylum. And just like Verrucht, as you saw earlier, Asylum has many of creepy Easter eggs, all over this place, and this is yet another great multiplayer map. 
Now Shinonuma is a much more original map, with only having minor aspects from the campaign level Semperfy and the multiplayer map Knee Deep. So there's definitely no like exact multiplayer map of Shinonuma like there was with Verruckt or Nocturne Toten. Now Darius shares a lot of similarities with the multiplayer map Nightfire, and I honestly completely forgot this map even existed until someone reminded me a couple weeks ago. But once you play Nightfire, it's so insane to think that this is Darius. Like this is a zombies map, but you're running around in completely new areas that you never were allowed to run in in Darius. So if you ever want to see the zombie maps, but in a new light, definitely give their multiplayer counterparts a good look over. The last little bit of information I have for you guys is Bettys in World of War are not affected by max ammos. If you have placed down your Bettys and you grab a max ammo, your Bettys will not refill. The only way to get new ones is to wait till the start of the round. That would make World of War Bettys one of the most rare equipments that you can possibly get. Doubling on that with the fact that Bettys are actually pretty powerful in World of War Darius just makes them even more sought after. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe. And an extra special thanks to B Rad the Man, Brian Hahn, Dr. Dopey, Fat Lucky Potato, Borg, G Daddy Smackdown, Giovanni Diaz, Icy Storm, Jordan Boylan, Jorge Burgos, Mayall, Mr. Ridgeway, Person Person, and Will Likens. Shout out to my Patreons, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.